We're, we're now uh, starting with basically the rapporteurs, uh, giving a brief presentation on what was discussed, uh, the highlights. It is not, of course, an exhaustive summary of what was discussed, because it was a full day of exchanges. Uh, part of the session afterwards will also be an opportunity for you all to contribute additional comments, not to reopen the discussions, because we could end up in two weeks, but uh, to add things that you think might be useful for, the, um, for, for people to remember. So, without further ado, I will ask Aaron, as the rapporteur of the Aaron Outschuler, for the Workstream 1 to take the floor. Do you have a mic? Yes, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> yes. Think it's on? Yep. Uh, I'm Aaron Altschuler. I'm an attorney at uh, Zuiljan, a law firm in the United States. And prior to joining Zuiljan earlier this year, I was at Yahoo, where I ran the global law enforcement response team. Um, let me just start by giving a quick reminder of the, the challenge from Workstream 1, which, of course, was on data and jurisdiction. Um, the, the challenge was how can transnational data flows and the protection of privacy be reconciled with lawful access requirements to address abuses. Criminal investigations increasingly require access to information about users and digital evidence stored by private companies in jurisdictions outside the requesting country. Uh, the traditional mutual legal assistance MLA system is under stress and competing approaches are proposed to solve this issue. What are the necessary safeguards and procedures to establish viable and scalable frameworks? So that was the challenge that our group was, was presented with. We started by focusing on a number of key operational challenges uh, to developing a framework for cross-border law enforcement requests. And we, first we identified a long list of issues, but I'll, I'll focus on a few of the, the most important ones that the group identified and then, and then dig into them just a bit to give folks some context. Uh, the key issues were, were localization, and here this is, this is a little bit different than the other issues. This is the risk of mandatory data localization requirements if nothing is done to change the status quo. The other key issues were what types of data would be subject to cross-border requests. There's basic subscriber information, traffic data, and then content, think stored emails and things like that. Um, criteria for jurisdiction. Uh, for example, would jurisdiction be based on the location of the server, the nationality of the user, the offense of the crime, the offense of the, the, the location of the offense? Um, then what should the baseline standard be? Um, for content, should the requesting party have to show probable cause, the US standard, or should it be something different, the standard of the country making the request? I'll talk about that more in a second. Um, and then the last key issue was uh, around user notification, both pre-hoc pre and post-hoc notification to the target of the request, uh, notifying that individual that, that the request had been issued so that he or she would be aware that, that a government is seeking access to his or her data. Talking a little bit in more detail about data localization, first there was a good, I, I thought a good definitional clarification in the group uh, around what localization actually means. And one of the discussants pointed out that there is, often people think about data localization as, the, the, as a mandatory localization requirement, but it might also mean the freedom of a user to locate his conversations or the data wherever he or she wants. And so those are two different meanings. Um, in terms of mandatory localization requirements, uh, there was one discussant who pointed out some advantages of localization, and those, those were identified as minimizing the number of eyes that see the data, uh, speed, and resilience. And then I think it's fair to say that um, many in the group highlighted a lot of disadvantages to mandatory localization requirements, and just to name some of them, uh, technical feasibility and cost, very difficult to scale uh, a global network uh, if you have a, a series of data localization requirements all over the world, um, 
human rights concerns in countries that have weaker human rights protections, uh, even greater impacts on small businesses who certainly wouldn't be able to comply with um, those types of requirements in countries all over the world, uh, and economic protectionism. Um, next, uh, jurisdiction criteria. Uh, one possibility being the location of the server. The critique identified here is that um, there could be multiple jurisdictions uh, at play. Also, data is often sharded, meaning um, I know from my own experience that an email, for example, the, 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 the headers might be in one place and the, the content of the email might, email might be in another place and then the attachment might be in still a third country. Um, and so when you say uh, that you have to comply with a request based on the location of the data um, and there are three locations or more, it's a very difficult situation. Um, Another option would be the nationality or the location of the user. Uh, here, uh, an advantage identified was that the target's location is, is important, of course, but a critique is that it can be difficult to identify uh, the location or nationality of a user. Many providers are not actually doing that today, and it might reduce the privacy of users if providers took the step of identifying them for the purpose of establishing jurisdiction. Just to quickly run through other options, um, they include uh, the location of, a, of the provider's corporate headquarters, uh, the location of the offense, and then um, some folks argue that there's no single factor that should establish jurisdiction and that could be, should be a, a series of, of factors, a, a, a sort of a multiple uh, factor application. Um, and folks pointed out that that would be a sophisticated approach that could match the facts, but the critique is that that's hard to enforce and limit, and home countries, the country where the request is received, would, would be inclined to choose their own law if given, if given the choice. Um, moving quickly to another issue, uh, we talked at some length about what the legal standard should be for a cross-border order when country X serves an order uh, on a provider in country Y. Uh, the group noted that there are material differences in the legal standard depending on the jurisdiction. Uh, and I think more discussion is, is required for sure on this issue to address whose legal standard should apply. For example, should it be the, the legal standard in the country receiving the request? Should it be the legal standard um, of the country making the request? Or should there be sort of a new set of minimum baseline standards that could be applied uh, across jurisdictions, almost a, a hybrid or a compromise approach. And then the last main issue I think we covered in the operational challenges section is user notice. Uh, I'm not sure this was even originally on the list. I think it came up a little bit by chance in the discussion, but it was really it, it really generated a lot of a lot of discussion. Um, and the role of the, the issue here, just taking a step back, is is the role that user notice should play um, in a cross-border framework. It's an important issue, as many many folks identified, because service providers are trustees for their customers' data. They look to provide trust and reassurance for their users. Uh, some folks mentioned that enterprises are are continuing to decide whether they can trust the cloud, and being able to notify users is an important element of that. Uh, of course, user notice is also an important human rights issue uh, for the data, uh, for data that's subject to actions of a state. Uh, it's an important uh, piece of the puzzle in, in transparency so that folks can understand the system generally and then specifically if a government is requesting uh, an individual's own data. Civil society representatives in the room noted that this is an important safeguard uh, to ensure that if there's not an adversarial process when the data is accessed by the government, it at least gives an opportunity for the user to know um, that this request has been made so that he or she might have the opportunity to challenge the request if they think it's an improper one. Okay, moving on to possible cooperation areas. Um, it's interesting, the, the legal policy framework here around, around how to make a a cross-border system happen is, is complicated and I think clearly a, a longer-term discussion, um, although uh, 
certainly some progress has been made and the discussions were, were very valuable. Uh, in the cooperation area section of the discussion, uh, a number of folks spent a lot of time talking about um, some things that have been happening sort of between providers and law enforcement. Uh, a dialogue around improvement of operational processes as opposed to um, legal policy framework. In other words, conversations that have been happening to just work within the current system to make things a little bit more manageable. Um, so for example, in, here in France, after the Charlie Hebdo attack, uh, I, I, the group mentioned that a number of providers have met with the, the French government um, to discuss things like a standardized format for requests, training on what data a particular provider uh, has available for law enforcement, um, establishing single points of contact, SPOCs for coordination of the process, sort of just things to make, make, the, make the process more efficient. The European Commission has also started this, this conversation with providers about making existing pro processes more efficient. Um, civil society did note that uh, there's a transparency issue uh, here if, if providers are, are having these discussions with law enforcement that it's important for there to be transparency in the process in order to ensure um, appropriate safeguards and user trust. Another area uh, of cooperation that folks seem to have a fairly broad consensus on was the valuable the, the need for, for continued information sharing. And um, in particular, it was noted the, the, role, the role that our hosts have been playing in, in already in identifying and disseminating relevant information uh, on the website. The other thing that our group did was start an email distribution list um, so that people can receive uh, important updates by email as, as well as on the website. Uh, and then another area of cooperation, a more, I think, a shorter term effort that people identified was continuing to work, and I know there's some work going on in this area already, but a, a extra push on standardizing transparency reporting, uh, both the reporting by providers around the number of requests they get and also better reporting by governments on, on the number of requests, which in particular was was um, highlighted as an area that could use significant improvement. Um, and so uh, that was another area identified. And then, um, can I, the survey, can I talk about the three areas identified in the survey? If you want, but I will come to Oh, all right. Uh, well, just, just quickly, because I, I thought it was interesting, the, the three areas that our, that our work stream identified in the survey as, as focus areas going forward. One, the top one was uh, the Internet and Jurisdiction Policy Network continuing to be a forum for, for cooperation as it has been uh, up until now and including, of course, at this conference. Um, number two, user notice. Uh, again, I was a little bit surprised because it was fairly low down the list um, at the beginning of the, the conversation, but, but that was identified as the number two area of priority. Uh, going forward, and then number three, transparency. Um, that's about it. I just wanted to say, I, from my perspective, I thought it was a, a very constructive conversation. I thought, um, I mean, I've been in lots of these types of meetings in smaller groups, but the ability, the, the opportunity to have people from so many different regions of the world and, and also stakeholders with so many different perspectives, I thought, um, Everyone was very respectful of each other's perspectives. I think everyone listened. I, I assume everybody learned something new. I certainly learned, learned, learned new things, and so I, I thought it was a very valuable session. Thank you. Thank you, Aaron, and thanks again for <laughs> the moderator and the, uh, and the reporters who have worked extensively during the, the whole day uh, as well. Thank you very much for the reporting. Um, Wolfgang, Wolfgang Schulz, who is the rapporteur for the uh, Workstream 2 on content. Yeah. Moderated thanks. by Yanis Karklins. Yes. Uh, thanks much. Um, 
was a marvelous group, I would say, because it was really diverse. And my feeling at least was that some of the uh, people were meeting in this kind of environment the first time. So the exchange was really, really great. And under the marvelous moderation of Janis, we came um, to some, I find, really tangible uh, conclusions and, and uh, ideas uh, how to move forward. Um, maybe at the beginning, uh, just... Um, uh, three cases I found really interesting because uh, one of the advantages of the group was that from completely different point of views and uh, different regions in the world, uh, we got examples for content-related uh, jurisdiction problems. And um, just, just three uh, I have still in mind, there are many others, and um, please excuse me if um, it's, it's very selective what I, what I um, tell here. The first one I would call the gaming of the Westphalian system. And uh, that was a case um, referred to uh, by a colleague from Latin America. He said that there was a case that um, uh, obviously a government wanted some uh, content to be put down. Uh, and what uh, actually happened was that not these in this country the problem was, if it was a problem, uh, was uh, solved, but uh, a Spanish company uh, used uh, US copyright law to bring this um, uh, uh, speech down that was uh, regarded as some um, uh, opposition speech that uh, was unwanted by the government. So the interesting thing uh, to, to, to see, uh, worrying as well, but nevertheless interesting. The second one, um, the second case um, uh, we discussed a little was uh, um, uh, to see um, that when we call about overblocking, uh, we have some traditional uh, settings in mind, but uh, when you have a system, and we were told that the systems are used uh, where one IP address is allocated uh, to different users, then the overspill can even mean that not only one um, uh, offering is uh, affected, but many that have nothing to do with the initial case. So that was the second one I found extremely striking to think about um, the uh, technical um, uh, elements uh, when we talk about um, uh, overblocking. And the last one I want to mention is that uh, we've learned from one uh, delegate, um, and I was not aware of that, I must uh, confess, that in the UK there is a, a law in the pipeline that uh, uh, makes it possible for um, uh, security agencies to directly uh, remove content from uh, computers and they do not have to go to the procedure and have something taken down on a platform level. Um, if that comes through, they have the opportunity to um, directly access um, the um, the uh, computers. And I think that uh, puts a different complexion on, on this issue um, as well. Just to, um, to uh, show you how uh, much we were into uh, different cases and, and uh, got new information in this uh, working group. But I want to focus on um, the um, tangible outcome and uh, just uh, mark some fields where we saw that uh, this network can be of great use when we uh, want to move uh, forward. And um, the result of the um, of the um, evaluation has already been mentioned, it's not as surprising as last Tuesday and not as worrying. Um, but nevertheless, um, um, number one in our group was uh, transparency, uh, by far the most mentioned uh, issue. And um, that's why I want to start with uh, the ideas um, uh, we um, developed uh, when it comes to transparency. <coughs> one um, action item we talked about was uh, that um, one of the deficits we see is that transparency on the government level is not uh, really given. Uh, there was the notion of the two-way transparency. We have to have transparency from both sides. Uh, we request something and who is um, acting on, on that um, request. And one idea was that uh, this group or a subsection of this group could work with one or two governments in a kind of pilot project um, to think about templates how to um, uh, guarantee transparency on a government level. So I think that's something we could um, think about as a uh, um, future joint activity. Uh, another thing was that um, uh, it was mentioned that uh, um, there is some transparency, at least when it comes to 
um, requests by governments now uh, from intermediary side, but there's still a lack of information about uh, private requests, and uh, that could be uh, something um, uh, to work on uh, as well. And it was mentioned that uh, sometimes companies uh, uh, say that um, they can't be as transparent as they want because of legal obstacles. And uh, it might be worthwhile to th um, elaborate on that a little and see what are those obstacles? Are they maybe just um, um, uh, easy to overcome and maybe just arguments put forward not to be as transparent as uh, required or where there are really uh, some, some obstacles and then we can have a discussion uh, about that, whether these uh, things have to um, uh, be there um, or uh, the problem can be solved in any other way. So you can see that uh, transparency was one thing we have uh, discussed really um, uh, intensely. Uh, the second thing that was mentioned as um, a possible um, field of cooperation was uh, best practice uh, uh, identification. We discussed it uh, even broader and said one idea might be to come um, um, with the um, um, best and worst practice uh, report, maybe every year or every two years, um, and uh, start a debate um, on the basis of, of this report. Um, delegates mentioned that in other fields of policy that can be r rather effective, uh, because these best and worst practices, of course, uh, get a lot of it attention, and um, um, that is something um, to discuss, I think, as well. The third... Um, rank of um, possible fields of cooperation was uh, the issue of uh, a shared vernacular. Um, we discussed that a lot and uh, I think the general feeling was um, that it is not so easy to come up with uh, a real shared definitions about hate speech or incitement or whatever, uh, but that does not mean to say that uh, this group cannot make a difference uh, when it comes to that. I think it's more about uh, talking about a common language or taxonomies um, that uh, make it possible to, to um, uh, to work on these issues. And one thing that was mentioned at the very beginning of the discussion um, uh, and um, was um, um, referred to later on is that we have to be very clear about what cases we are talking about when it comes to content-related uh, issues. There are so many different things. It can be a request by government or private. It can be a private directly or by, by court and court order. It can be based on copyright, on uh, hate speech, uh, on whatever. And it might be helpful to have a taxonomy where you have later on specific cases and you can say, I'm not just now talking about the intersection of uh, this uh, kind of of, uh, uh, claim and this kind of uh, requester and only that's what we are talking about, not uh, um, the um, government's action, not the right to be forgotten about this specific case. I think a lot um, um, could, be, um, could be a lot improved the discussion among us but also among um, different uh, stakeholders acting in this field. Um, when that was, was clearer. And the same is true for different types of intermediaries. We learned that at least under um, uh, uh, even under American law, we have at least uh, four different types of intermediaries that the law refers to, and other countries have uh, distinctions as well. So uh, what I heard very often in the discussion was, wait a moment, we have to make clear what kind of notification are we talking about, what kind of intermediary are we talking about. And so that's I think, is um, something um, to work on and where this group and these diverse uh, viewpoints and, and knowledge bases are very valuable. We were aware that it is not easy to agree on, on values, for example. It's extremely important to have this discussion. Um, but there was the notion that uh, one value we can all agree on, and that is uh, that we have to have due process. And so one idea was uh, to uh, flesh out uh, more precisely what we mean with, uh, with this notion of due process. And there were some critical remarks that even countries that um, um, are regarded as... Uh, to be in the master class of rule of law uh, when it comes to these um, notice and take down, sometimes send the note, uh, please take that down and don't tell. <laughs> and uh, uh, so I think it's not an easy discussion as well, but we thought it uh, worth uh, um, talking about that. Um, very briefly, um, 
other points that have been mentioned. Um, um, apart from that, um, we thought that it might be a kind of low-hanging fruit when it comes to uh, requestee and requester identification, both as important uh, according to our discussion, um, um, to um, um, have a kind of um, database on, on that uh, to make sure that when there comes a request, maybe several requests from one country, that you know whom to ask what, what is actually um, my partner who can solve this uh, problem that there is a contradiction maybe between different um, kinds of requests, uh, which can start as a kind of phone book uh, that was mentioned, but can of course uh, include um, uh, more information when it's growing. Um, that was uh, something uh, that was mentioned uh, as well. Um, we talked a little about redress and remediation. Um, there was the notion that um, we see improvement when it comes to that, but there's a lot to be done. And um, that there is uh, now the situation that at least with some platforms you get some results if you know somebody or have access to a pressure group that uh, can make um, uh, someone react. Uh, but there is no real level playing field there. And so it's worth uh, thinking about mechanisms, uh, standards, platforms that make sure that someone who is affected by um, a takedown, for example, that has uh, the possibility to, to give voice at least um, and know uh, who to, um, to uh, address. Some um, additional points and then I come to an end. Um, um, that have been mentioned, and again, please excuse me if it's not uh, exhaustive and some point you find important has not been mentioned. I've sent all my notes to the organizers, so no idea is lost. Um, there was um, the mentioning of um, judicial training and awareness rising, um, and there was a notion that um, it might be helpful um, to include the um, judges community and government actors which have not been part of the conversation so far. Someone mentioned that a lot of uh, um, parts of governments are already involved, but others are affected but are not involved right now. And they can be um, maybe powerful partners uh, in this dialogue. Um, um, that was one thing that was um, um, identified um, as well. I think I uh, leave it uh, as it is, and uh, thanks again to this marvelous group. I have learned a lot um, and it was an extremely interesting experience. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Wolfgang, and thanks, Yanis, again for the, uh, the moderation. Uh, Stefan van Gelder is uh, reporting on the work uh, stream uh, three that was moderated by Martin Butterman. Uh, please, Stefan. Thank you, Bertrand. <coughs> uh, hello, everyone. My name is Stefan van Gelder. Uh, I'm the chairman of Milathen, a consultancy on domain name and internet related matters. Uh, before that, I uh, owned and operated uh, a registrar and a registry, and I have been uh, chair of the GNSO Council and of the nominating committee at ICANN for the last two years. Um, as Bertrand just said, the Workstream 3 on domain names was moderated by Martin Bottoman, who was uh, Unable to be here today, but uh, uh, sends his best wishes. Um, our uh, problem statement was that trust in the domain name system is critical to the functioning of the global internet. The neutrality of the DNS vis-a-vis -vis political and commercial pressure is a key factor in that regard. Yet, given the difficulty of dealing with illegal sites across borders, pressure is mounting to suspend domain names because of the alleged illegality of the underlying content or activity. Registries and registrars are receiving more and more of these requests coming from inside or outside their country of incorporation. And before I start going into the detail of what we discussed, I do want to say perhaps start by the end and say that um, I think that the, the takeaway from the mood of the group was that there was a renewed sense of urgency about not only discussing these matters but uh, finding a common solution to them. Uh, uh, one of the key takeaways that everyone um, got f uh, from attending Workstream work 3 was that these issues now 
it's really clearly time to do something about them. And, and we got very clear messages uh, of that kind from participants in the room, that uh, um, it was time for all the stakeholders to come together and try to find common solutions to uh, these problems. So we heard as um, uh, uh, operational challenges, uh, we heard from registry and registrar operators, we heard from governments, we heard from uh, uh, people that are uh, representatives of uh, registrants, i.e. the people that register domain names. And we, we learnt about the operational difficulties of dealing with these uh, multiple requests uh, that people get sent. So, for example, uh, we learned that some registries have put, have set up systems uh, to use trusted notifier networks uh, which uh, they feel they can then uh, talk to or can talk to them to ask for domain name suspensions or uh, remedial action for abuse uh, that is considered to be uh, carried out through domain names. Uh, we learned that the motivation for doing this often for, for registries and possibly for registrars as well, is not only that it's the right thing to do, but also that uh, it, it, it enhances the company's reputation. Uh, the people dealing with this, registries and registrars, obviously want to make sure that their networks, uh, be it a TLD or their own client networks, are uh, seen to be a safe place, a place where abuse is not allowed to run amok. Um, and uh, a lot of the conversation, I'll go into uh, more operational details in a minute, but a lot of conversation uh, turned, uh, uh, was around things that I've heard in other work streams and specifically work stream two around both vernacular and due process, i.e. being able to understand when you get, uh, someone sends you an abuse uh, notification on a domain name, being able to understand uh, at the party sending the abuse should understand what they're asking for, and we were often told that that was not the case. Uh, so people might ask for a domain name suspension, not understanding exactly what that means. Uh, and also that um, if there is a request for domain name suspension or withdrawal or deletion or whatever, uh, that there be due process, i.e. the registrant or the, the parties affected by the request be allowed to um, speak uh, on behalf of themselves and, and make the case for themselves that maybe this is not abuse or, or it's not what it's uh, portrayed to be. Uh, we heard from registry operators that um, um, most of them tend to react to court orders first uh, and in many cases only. The reason for that being that uh, registries and registrars do not want to be seen as being judge, jury and executioner in these cases. And they were very, very clear on this point that uh, um, there are only very few specific cases of abuse that they feel comfortable with taking action on directly. One such, two such cases were mentioned. One was obvious phishing attacks, the other was uh, child abuse. Uh, but even then, when we started talking about these things, variants came along of people saying, but it may be, um, I mean, one example that, that was given, which, is, which uh, certainly spoke to, to me uh, as being part of the problems that these companies face, is that child abuse sounds simple, but actually, uh, when you have uh, a child abuse reported to you as a registry or registrar, the people that uh, you may see in the online content aren't holding up their passports and uh, they're not actually uh, making it obvious whether they're minors or adults. So uh, cases like that, which on the face of it seem simple, often are not. Um, we were told that registries and registrars are, uh, as the problem statement uh, that I read out just a minute ago stated, under increased pressure and 
I think the term constant pressure is probably more uh, appropriate to, uh, respond, to, to, to take down names that get constant requests. And um, because uh, some of these registries and registrars are small companies, it does become a resource issue. Um, the market is very competitive, the margins are very small, and when uh, you have to even open an, an email claiming abuse, you lose your margin on domain names. One participant said that the, the margin was so small that only opening the email meant that no money was going to be made on that domain name at all. So um, that was another issue for them, is how to, just from a resource point of view, staff, to deal with this and the money involved, how are they uh, expected to deal with it? One solution that was touted several times was ADR, Alternative Dispute Resolution, uh, and uh, many people pushed for that to be um, uh, a better solution or a more, more de facto solution to some of these problems. Um, uh, registrar told us that uh, uh, they do try and investigate claims, but they have to determine whether the claim is spurious or legitimate. And that obviously is up to uh, the registrar and the cultural and, and financial and, and, and geographic circumstances that they're in. For example, we were told that some of these complaints come in languages or scripts even that the registrars can't read. So the buck stops there, you know, uh, if you can't read the complaint, you don't even know whether it's a complaint or just a spam email. Um, we were asked, or some asked, why is it that um, we uh, should work so hard on domain name suspension in any uh, event? The reason behind the question, the example that, that I found very interesting that was given to us was, if you know that there's crime going on in a house, uh, in a street. You don't try and tackle the crime by changing the number of the house. And uh, we were, that the phrase domain uh, name hopping or jurisdiction hopping was mentioned as the fact that these crooks that are uh, doing illegal activities through domain names will register many of them and will have no problem jumping from one jurisdiction to the next and going from the gtldi, the generic .com type space, to the cctldi, the .fr type space. And the rules there are very different. So then we got into a discussion about who oversees what. ICANN was mentioned, the IGF, uh, the Internet Governance Forum was mentioned, uh, Internet and Jurisdiction was mentioned as a possible uh, forum for discussion. Uh, but in none of these areas it was recognized that everyone all the parties were at the table. Uh, it was also recognized that there is urgency in keeping the momentum of the discussion going and making sure that um, uh, one suggestion was that uh, ING could uh, table a discussion uh, in the next few weeks uh, to make sure that the momentum on these issues uh, and, uh, and of the discussion on these issues continues. Um, we heard a very, very clear message, as I said earlier on, that action needs to be taken now if it's going to be multi-stakeholder action, i.e. industry self-regulation, then it needs to be done now because otherwise we, end up, we may end up with legal frameworks that we don't like imposed on us, us being the community in that room, obviously. Um, we had a bit of a discussion about whose responsibility it was to, to, to set up um, uh, the ability to know, to have a trusted notifier, i.e. to know who, who is complaining and, and who are they. And uh, another issue that Workstream 2 obviously had to deal with is, you know, you get a request from people saying that are uh, very legitimate and that say, you know, please take this domain d down. Uh, pharmaceutical, uh, the pharmaceutical industry was mentioned in this slide uh, because there's an urgent need for uh, it being taken down because it's selling illegal medicine. And then if registries look at the request in a bit, uh, dig a bit deeper, they realize that the medicine isn't necessarily illegal legal in their own country. 
but it may be illegal in the country of the requester. Or the requester is claiming authority that they, they don't have. So once again, these are not uh, simple problems. I think I've gone over the uh, problem statement um, uh, to an, uh, in enough detail. Um, I think uh, in the cooperation areas, very quickly, um, once again, um, people need to speak the same language. It's been said before. I think it needs to be said again. Registrars and registries, for example, talk in EPP, uh, which is a protocol that they use, uh, which is standardized in the G space, uh, to send uh, domain name related commands. But uh, so there are things like uh, client hold, uh, domain suspension, things, terms like that that are used there that uh, other people use without understanding, and that is a, a problem. Um, we were told that uh, a trusted notifier is two words. There's trust and notifier. And it may be that one entity does not have to do both. It may be that several entities could take on these tasks. It might work better if the trust element is brought by one entity and the notifying element brought by another. We were told that the problem of uh, no standardization in the, in the domain industry and uh, uh, crossover from the G to the CCTLD space, where they use different who is formats, they do di different, they, uh, the CCTLDs have no co direct contracts with ICANN, et cetera, was a problem as well. So uh, transparency becomes very important. Transparency of the people reporting and the kinds of abuse uh, requests that they get and what they do about them. Um, and it was suggested that maybe the ICANN community could try and set up an informal discussion around these issues. Uh, we had uh, uh, um, half an hour of discussion around uh, how it might be formalized and then stop there because it was obviously not going anywhere, but uh, uh, it was thought that, uh, once again, an informal discussion and perhaps supported by INJ would be uh, a useful thing to do. And just looking ahead, a few ne next steps uh, with a, a very short calendar, you know, 2017 was mentioned as, as, as a, a goal for looking ahead. Um, uh, it was said that uh, there is an important distinction to be drawn between hard and soft law. And uh, soft law is the kind of industry self-regulation that we might be looking at. Um, once again, a due process came into the discussion constantly and the importance of both understanding what constitutes due process and how to make sure that there is due process. Um, uh, the terminology part of it, once again, was there. It was suggested that INJ might uh, work on research papers to flesh out issues that were less well understood and make sure they came to the fore, that they might organize online seminars uh, to continue the conversation without requiring people to be physically in one place at the same time. Um, and uh, there was, um, once again, um, well, one last point, and then I'll stop there. Uh, just registries and registrars uh, were um, keen to point out that there's also a legal issue for them in terms of legal liability. If they decide to take down a domain name uh, responding to a request, they stand, uh, they run the risk of being sued themselves because uh, they are not technically or operationally supposed to be just taking down domain names, which may affect someone's business online, in a, in, uh, and that business may be carried out in a legal jurisdiction elsewhere. So um, with that, I'll, uh, I'll close and just say that obviously, uh, as Bertrand mentioned, this has to be an incomplete account of what was said yesterday in Workstream 3, and uh, uh, I do ask that uh, anyone else that was in that room, uh, if I've missed something out, please do say so. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stefan, and uh, thank you in his absence to Martin for the, uh, for the moderation. Can I, uh, the, the survey was mentioned, can I ask uh, that the results be uh, briefly displayed? I want to make uh, just a quick comment on, on that. Thank you for having taken the time to fill this survey yesterday. 
uh, we have, um, and the team has diligently worked to extract a certain number of information. They have already been mentioned, but I want to, to do uh, quick comments on the cross-cutting elements. There were three main messages. You've already heard them, but um, the first one is the importance of the vernacular, and it was mentioned, the fact that people speak the same language. Uh, one, by the way, comment that was in, in one of the work streams was that the first thing is not to use the term vernacular because people don't understand what it means. <laughs> so that's a perfect illustration of <laughs> talking and knowing what we put behind words. So there were suggestions of using taxonomy, uh, terminology, and that sort of thing. Fundamentally, the word is language. It's, are we sure that when people use a word, they understand the same thing behind the same word? And that was very present, as has been said, in both content and the domains, and particularly in domains, it's a major priority. Um, can, can we have the, um, um, the slide, if possible? Yeah, okay, we'll come. Uh, the second message that has been mentioned is about transparency, and here again, it was very strong in two work streams, in data and content, and in content, it was even a major uh, priority. Um, without belaboring, what is interesting, and, and thanks to Wolfgang, so here are the, um, the, the, the results. Um, transparency has many different aspects, and it's great that you decompose uh, those, those aspects, just like in vernacular, for instance, in the domains. I, I understood that there were discussions about a certain number of terms that had to be uh, discussed. The, the type of action, the type of abuse, the, the, the type of uh, requester, and so on. So in transparency, uh, it covers different dimensions, but what I want to highlight is that transparency is also a way to have fact-based discussions and to reduce the level of uncertainty, to know exactly what is the importance of a problem, where are the main uh, problems, uh, and having facts and numbers is important. And also, it's a confidence-building measure. Transparency is something that allows people to be confident that they know what the process is, uh, and it is connected to another word that was not mentioned here, but that, is, uh, that has permeated a lot of things, which is clarity. Having clarity on the, what is the legal framework, what are the procedures, this is part of the whole due process discussion. And the third element uh, that was mentioned as well in two work streams as a main uh, area for cooperation uh, was a strong message in data and domains, is the need for, in particular, INJ, but in more general, of having spaces for continued interaction between the actors. And it's clearly an illustration of the status of both of those work streams where there are several actors that need to coordinate and bring what we have labeled policy coherence and reduce the uncertainty about what the others are doing and facilitate um, at least concertation, if not coordination. Finally, beyond those messages that were across work streams, there were for each of the work streams, very interesting, specific topics. Uh, user notification in data, I'm very happy that it, it came up because actually it's, uh, it's first good that it emerged spontaneously and it is something that is extremely important. Uh, the notion of best compilation of best practices or good practices uh, in the content space because all the platforms and all the major actors and major states have developed interactions and procedures among themselves, and it's great to be able to share also for smaller actors, smaller platforms, smaller intermediaries and smaller countries, uh, elements of procedure. Uh, and the, the second, the, the last one is uh, for domains, which has a specifically high role of notifiers, uh, the notion of best practices for notifiers. And there has been uh, discussions on, on this, and I think it's very, very useful. So with this, I, I close this, uh, this first element. It provides a, a remarkable uh, help for us in terms of the roadmap, and I'll come back to that later, for the work in, in 2017 and beyond. Uh, it's important in the discussions that we'll have afterwards in debriefing with the reporters and moderators to have a good understanding of who is already doing what. Uh, part of our 
job, I think, is also to, um, no pun intended, to convene the conveners. There are actors who are gathering other actors and trying to make them work. And there's a part of the job is to bring them also together to allow them to coordinate. Uh, and that's the kind of facilitation role we can, we can do. Thank you very much again for the work uh, that you've done uh, yesterday. And with that, uh, it's the moment to move to the next session.